Wednesday. Good morning. I want you to know that we've been looking forward to this day for quite a long time, so we're excited that it's finally happening and that we can have this dialogue. I want you to note first the title to my presentation, which I won't reread. But you should know that an earlier version was titled, What's Policy Got to Do With It? Got to Do With It. <laughs> so I want you to keep those both titles in mind as we proceed. I am a policy person. I have a passion about it, and it was my greatest class at SFU was the graduate policy class. So have some tolerance, please, for uh, how passionate I am. And I think it is important that we've already been discussing a lot about the policies. So let's proceed. And what you'll see is that what I'm going to be doing is against that backdrop that both Dr. Boshe and Dr. Cassidy have presented. And that is to examine the existing policies that are in place, which could address cyberbullying behavior at the university level, in order to determine, well, um, what differing lenses might have different impacts. So you have different policies, you may have different impacts, should you chose, choose to go in that direction in applying a particular policy with this kind of lens or that kind of lens. So it really is a descriptive and more foundational piece that I'm presenting today. And just a context setter and reminder that from our own study, just to remember that the preliminary analysis of 1,800 plus students surveys from our study suggests levels of cyberbullying victimization at around 22%. So it is an emerging problem, it is a problem. So what are the dynamics here? Well, obviously, the shift from high school to college or university is a transition. You get students who are now young adults and they have increased accountability, uh, greater um, in terms of their individual responsibilities, they've increased as well. So really cyberbullying at this level is conceptualized differently than it would be for the earlier grades as well. And the balance seems to shift, for example, looking at even case law, in terms of the, the balance appearing to shift to more to the accused rights, as in looking at freedom of expression rights than you would see in the earlier years. So in terms of policy intent, we also see differences. The university environment has more policy options available. Uh, the decision making as to which stream, which policy applies is the key to how a particular case is going to be handled. So does it go through the application of student conduct policies? Is this student incivility? Does it go through uh, human rights policies? Is this discrimination? Communication technologies regulation policies? Publishing uh, obscene defamatory emails? Or is it workplace safety policies? Or does it get moved out of the university altogether as, for example, to the justice system? So, my argument is that a clear roadmap is probably necessary to navigate what I think is a rather complex policy landscape. Okay. So in, in light of all of these realities we've been hearing about this morning, uh, the purpose that I have is to explore the current university policy environment governing cyberbullying behavior. And there does seem to be a void in the research literature. And as we've just heard, again, from both Dr. Boshe and Dr. Cassidy, when 15 solutions were presented for both surveys, the first with the faculty and the third choice with the students was the one of engaging with the university community in developing strong anti-cyberbullying -cy policy. And so our question here, what does it mean for cyberbullying responses to it at the university level when differing policies with differing policy intents are employed? And what I'm 
going to be reporting on is a scan of university policies that are relevant to this issue. And the scan was conducted between November 2011 and January 2012 using policy documents posted online on the websites of the 74 Canadian universities. And we might well discover a different array of policies should we do the scan today. However, I think the same issues of where to go with any one form of cyberbullying and how to know the effects of going in one direction or another would probably remain. So we have all of these policy options. Many of them have relevant sections of them that could be used to address cyberbullying. So how we proceeded was in two ways. Uh, we, we sought different levels of administrative and operational policies, including student to student, student to instructional staff, instructional staff to students, and instructional staff to instructional staff. And we first tried to locate a policy list or um, gazette uh, repository of the policies online to see if there are policies of relevance. And that was from each of the, the universities. And we scoured those for potential policies that might be relevant. And second, we used the search terms that you see there to try and see if we could generate more or expand on that list of uh, relevant policies. Then we actually did read the policies to determine whether they were in fact relevant. Oh, well, <laughs> we do that. And in fact, uh, the relevant ones were then indexed by a university in province. And even more so after that, after they were identified, we then scrutinized even more closely the language within the policies themselves. And we coded each of the policies in a yes-no fashion for such things as definition, types of cyberbullying behaviors, possible penalties, sanctions, complaint procedures to follow, which office to contact, prevention, and specific forms of harassment and, and uh, bullying using ICT. So, we did collect a total of 465 discrete policy documents from the websites of the 74 universities. And the table on this slide indicates the total number of policy documents from each province and territory, and the average number of policies per, uni per university, which was about six. And the distribution of the policies by province and territory itself shows some variations, and there are variations between provinces and territories in the numbers and types of policies and, in fact, between universities in uh, the same province. These variations, notwithstanding, I think one point that should be noted is that all of the universities scanned had multiple policies that are or could be relevant to addressing cyberbullying behavior. And as such, some degree of ambiguity over which policy to apply may exist. Again, I come back to this, a clear roadmap for direction may be needed. The types of policies covered a range of areas and three main types did emerge. By far the most common one, not unsurprisingly, were those we categorized as codes of student conduct and discipline. And these policies, remember to Go to the next slide, Margaret. Um, represented almost one third of all relevant policies. The second most frequent type of uh, policy, harassment slash discrimination, including sexual harassment, uh, racism, hate speech, etc. Overall, 17% of the policies collected were of this type, but then we also included the human rights and ethics category to bring that to a total of about 22%. A close third uh, of uh, the most common type were those pertaining to electronic communication. So, email, acceptable computer use, IT services, etc. With about, again, 22% of all policies falling into that category. 
But aside from those top three, the other policy types were far less common, but we did find policies pertaining to violence, so safe workshop, uh, campus, freedom of information, privacy, confidentiality, civility, and respectful workplace, other types of policies such as students with disabilities, human resources, employee faculty codes of conduct, and charters of student rights and responsibilities. We also analyzed the content looking for those specific components I mentioned earlier. And you would think providing a definition of the prohibitive behavior would seem to be a fundamental part of any policy that aims to actually address it. However, such an assumption was not uh, confirmed since fewer than half of the 465 policies included a definition of the prohibitive behavior, whether that was harassment, threats, uh, defamation, or other similar behaviors. An example of a very detailed uh, definition can be found in Queen, Queen's University's Harassment Discrimination Complaint Policy and Procedure, which provides the following types of definitions, definitional framework, followed up with equally detailed definitions of sexual harassment, race and racism, heterosexism, and transphobia. So just, I'll just do the first two sentences there. Queen's University recognizes that all members of the university community have the right to be free from harassment and discrimination. This includes sexual harassment, harassment based on gender, race, ethnicity, religion, creed, and, social, and sexual orientation or analogous grounds. And then it goes on to expand more on harassment and discrimination. Some policies included definitions that were somewhat less detailed but still more informative than no uh, definition at all. For example, Mount Allison's University Policy on Workplace Harassment provides the following definitions. Personal harassment means any objectionable conduct, comment, or display that is known or ought reasonably to be known to be offensive to an employee, whether it occurs once or on a number of occasions. And then it does continue on in more detail about personal harassment as that may be possibly uh, discriminatory. And while most policies did not specifically define cyberbullying, almost all of them, about 93%, did provide examples of what types of behaviors fell under the scope of any one particular policy, such as uh, threats, slander, violations of privacy, etc. For, for instance, the University of Calgary's electronic communications policy specifically prohibits such things as offensive obscene or indecent images, data or any material that would violate the law, uh, defamatory material, and, and so forth. So as we were proceeding through these policies, it became more and more evident, and we came to appreciate, that the policies themselves are not necessarily mutually exclusive, given that they're often referencing the same behavior. So again, which policy should be applied. And I, again, reference back, maybe uh, some kind of roadmap is needed. We also paid attention to which proportion of the policies actually made reference to cyber behavior, whether it's cyber bullying, online harassment, appropriate uses of ICT, and so forth. And overall, 37% of the policies included specific reference to the cyber component. But in this context of what we've been hearing about, the reality of university students in terms of the amount of time they spend online, uh, the interactions they have online, it would seem the policy environment may not yet fully reflect and acknowledge those unique and specific realities. And it may be nothing more than just the insertion uh, the acknowledgement of cyber misbehaviors or however you want online harassment to have that online cyber acknowledgement within existing policies. So while policies instruct us about values to be secured, 
uh, to be secured, and their balance, for example, the balance between the rights of the accused versus the rights of the victim. They can also suggest actions and procedures that might be taken to secure that policy intent and that balance, to make clear that balance. We found that the majority of the policies, 77% we scanned, did in fact tell the reader the steps we've taken when a breach of the policy occurred. And similarly, the majority of the policies set out specific sanctions or at least a range of uh, the penalties that might apply depending on the circumstances. So both examples are very clear uh, signposting. Interestingly, prevention does not feature prominently in the policies potentially aimed at cyberbullying at the university level. Only 22% of the policies referenced prevention in some way. In some cases, though, the policy suggested that prevention is a key component. For instance, the University of Montreal's harassment policy. Oops. Um, which states within its fundamental principles that prevention constitutes a priority of the policy. Concordia University's similar policy states as the first policy point, preventing harassing behavior requires increased awareness of the impact that one's actions may have on others. The university firmly believes that prevention is the best tool of such behavior. the conclusion and takeaway points. So the scan of university policies applicable to instances of cyberbullying at the university level reveals that a range of different policies exist which could address the behavior. The current study does bring an awareness to the potential impacts on decision making and outcomes of adopting different policy lenses or different directions. It appears there should be a clear roadmap for the streaming of such cases, since you have obviously a wide array, a wide range of applicable policies that does suggest universities should be dealing with cyberbullying through the provision of transparent and consistent directions down the road. Uh, also, we want to, at this point, remind that it's not just the mere existence of the policies that's sufficient here. In essence, um, measures have to be taken to ensure awareness within the university community of the existence of the policy. In fact, proper policy implementation requires awareness of the policy, programs in place to support its application, and ongoing evaluation to ensure its adequacy to achieve the policy intents and the balance. And finally, the present policy study should be compared with a legal analysis of the legislation which impacts universities with respect to cyberbullying, as we will next hear, in order to integrate and understand both policy and law environments. So you see, that's what policy has to do with it. So, thank you.